Hey guys, I'm the Spudler and welcome to my channel. In this week's community video I want to talk about content, but this time not what we consume, but where it comes from. First off though, I want to apologise to anyone out there that thinks I'm being a bit preachy. I have been known to be. All these videos are really just my opinion and based on research that I'm currently doing. You see, I want to cover a trial that is due in court in August and therefore I started off simply by doing my due diligence. But the more I read, the more some of the fundamental issues that we have with true crime content started to come into focus. Now, I love to learn and also I believe that knowledge is power. So I wanted to share my findings with my true crime companions. And I know that there are a number of people right now trying to help make our genre a little bit more professional, a little bit more considerate and compassionate and a little bit more truthful. And I wanted to do my bit too. So hopefully something in one of my videos will spark an idea in someone's mind and perhaps it even might lead to a solution being found to some of the issues that we're having. Anyway, that's my hope. And um, being forever the optimist, what a girl can dream, can't she? Anyway, with all my community videos, feel free to use them in whatever way you want to. The music was made for me by my husband, so there aren't any copyright issues there. And basically, as they say in London, fill your boots. So, enough with the preamble, let's get the intro rolling and then I can get into the video. Some of you may be aware that Stitch in Leather, a small content provider, has been working on a letter that can be sent out to various officials as an expression of our concern and request for action in protecting the victims and their families from all the additional upset social media can cause. So first off, let's listen to what this letter says. And if you have any comments, ideas or simply just want to get involved, please feel free to contact Stitch in Leather. Her channel details are included in the description. And all I can ask is that you're respectful if you contact her. I'm sure she will value any feedback that you might have. But please don't be abusive or aggressive. There's absolutely no need for it. All we're trying to do right now is just see if we can improve things a little. And what's the harm in that? So here's the letter. To whom it may concern. This letter is being sent to you because myself as a concerned citizen. I am highly distressed about how social media deals with victims and their families when something has happened such as having a missing child or having a murdered family member. So many social media creators are speculating, which causes rumors to be passed around. These rumors are and can be extremely detrimental to the victims, their family members, and the case itself. I urge you to look for yourself into some of the creators, even on just YouTube and how they are misleading many people in regards to these cases. They are very easy to spot, and it's easy to see who is talking facts and who is putting out rumors. My request to you is that you look into this matter very seriously and please discuss with the family members about these dangers of speaking to as social media. I would like you to also pass on the information of these dangers to all your colleagues in your said field, as well as to your local law enforcement agencies. This is an incredibly important situation that is going on, that has been getting consistently worse over the past three years. There haven't been any cases solved by so-called YouTube creators going out and looking for the victims. There has been a few cases where people who do stream on YouTube have been helpful, where it was someone who heard about the situation and looked back into their camera recordings to find some information that was needed in the investigation of this case. Most of the time, these creators are speculating, causing rumors, taking the words of the victim or loved one, and mixing them up, simply not putting out the facts. It is imperative that when you encounter someone, a victim, a family member, a witness, that they are warned about discussing their situation with social media. It should be the professionals such as the police, grief, counselors, and trained family media managers to release any information, if at all. 
I further request that you consider having this be part of a normal conversation that you have when you are dealing with the families as first responders. This is extremely important for the safety and mental well-being of both the victims and their family members and friends. Far too much false information is being released and it is simply not doing any good for any of these cases. These families deserve the right to privacy, but unfortunately, too many in the mainstream media are doing everything they can to try and get this information before law enforcement. The chances of them causing problems with both the inevitable outcome, to the trial's final decision of the court, information to anyone in your field, as well as to your local law enforcement agencies. The misinformation needs to stop. Destroying families needs to stop. Ruining cases needs to stop. The only way we can do this is by having those who respond first to the victim and their families, informing these people of such dangers, and their right to stay silent. Unfortunately, many of these family members feel like they are being forced into speaking with the media, and because of this, things can be said that have no bearing on what is actually going on. These so-called creators slash media investigators, who have zero training in the field, are pressuring families into speaking. This needs to stop. I am sending this letter to you as well as others in the field of law enforcement, prosecution, and defense. From first responders to eventually Congress, where maybe some laws can be set as to what can be said and what should not be said. There is a long list of YouTube creators who take advantage of the situation in order to make money. In other words, they are making money off the back of missing, killed, assaulted people, and this is not appropriate in any way shape or form. Thank you for your attention and consideration in this matter. I do hope that you understand that this is a very serious and pressing matter. How many people's lives have to be destroyed just because someone is looking for the almighty dollar? Thank you, and sincerely yours. Now I've left a link to where you can get access to this letter on Stitch and Leather's channel. Please go over there, download it, and if you have a case in your area where you think it's appropriate, send it out to those who need to see it. Because I think this is a great start and at least we're moving forward and trying to do something to just improve our community just a little. Now what this letter did for me is to get me thinking and trying to work out what some of the issues are and maybe how we can help to solve them. So the first thing that came to my mind was how we receive our content, where that information comes from and how it's used. And the first obvious thing that came to my mind was that there is a big difference between the content, i.e. the facts, that we get from law enforcement and from, in the main part, mainstream media, and the content that we get from interviews with victims and the families and the digging we do as a community into the pasts of these people. And in reality, most of the content that we receive comes from either law enforcement or from the families and friends of the victim. And there is a fundamental difference in the type of content each of these groups provide us with. Law enforcement is very much trained. They are disciplined, disconnected emotionally from the case, and they very much control the information that they feed the public because they're aware of an awful lot more about this case than we are and their priority is not to harm the case if and when something goes to court in any way by releasing information that say could tip off the perpetrator or contaminate the jury pool. For a family's perspective, on the other hand, their priorities are very different. Their priority isn't solving the case and putting somebody in jail. Their priorities are very much more emotional, immediate, and their main concern is finding their loved one or at least finding out what happened to their loved one. So this type of information is always going to be full of much more emotional content than the raw facts. And I define emotional content as where you take a fact, but then you wrap around it your own perspective on that fact. Basically, it's where fact and opinion merge together. Right now, I think we are taking factual content provided by law enforcement and emotional content provided by the families of victims and treating them with exactly the same weight. And I think we're all beginning to realise that this emotional content may not always be best for the case or even finding the missing person because it muddies the waters and everything gets a bit chaotic and messy, to be honest. From my experience of watching true crime, these families start off working very well with law enforcement, but once they come to social media, it does appear that that relationship starts to deteriorate. And I wondered why. 
in my opinion, it seems that once they start coming to social media and spilling the beans on other aspects of the case, their personal lives, anything to do with the person who's missing, things between them and law enforcement start to break down. Families often start spilling the beans on information that probably really isn't very relevant to the case, but it takes us down rabbit holes that we then report to law enforcement and sadly, that, as they've told us, slows down their investigations. It's because, as we know, they are legally obliged to follow up every lead, no matter how stupid it might be. And sadly, as we've seen time and time again, these families just start adding to the chaos. And that, I think, is where the real problem lies. So I had a little think about this particular problem. And here is where I am right now with my thinking. For the purposes of what I'm talking about, I'll define uncontrolled content as that which is found online and that can be discovered pretty much by anybody if they go looking for it. This content may not have been carefully considered ethically, or the impact it might have not only on the victims, but also on an active case. And at the moment, the victims' loved ones, their families, anybody connected to a particular case, the information that comes from them has no real control over it before it gets to us. And for the purposes of this, I define controlled content as that which has been carefully considered and is covered by either legal or ethical guidelines before it's made public. Now, any family of a victim is going to be in a hugely emotional state when they first come to social media. And because they're very emotional, they are going through trauma. They're not thinking clearly and not probably behaving the way that they would normally behave. But one thing all these families have in common is they're desperate. And we take that desperation and turn it into content. And I'm saying we here because as a community, we all have a responsibility to a lesser or greater degree. By allowing these families to give us content that is unfiltered and doesn't have the perspective of any legal or active case perspective on it, we're doing ourselves and those families a huge disservice in my opinion. So, because I'm a task-based type of person, I decided to then think about how this could be changed and how we can do our bit to protect these families from themselves as much as from YouTube. And the first obvious thing that I considered was transferring the families and friends of victims out of the area of uncontrolled content and move it over to the other side. Now, of course, this is probably easier said than done. But perhaps the first and most simplest way of approaching this is to provide these families with information and guidance in the initial stages before they come to social media so that they come with a full knowledge of how they can use us effectively, what to expect, and also to protect themselves to a certain degree. So to me, it seems clear that we need to create some sort of package that can be provided to these victims' families that provides them with choices, information and the ability to select or go to a particular creator, professional, advocate, whatever it is that they choose, and then work with them to create the content that they want to provide to YouTube. And at least they have the guidance, they have a safe pair of hands, and they will probably have someone there that will be able to filter out the information that they do not believe will have a positive impact on the case, work with the families to explain this, and then hopefully the content that we get provided with is still as informative as it would have been, but they've just filtered out the unnecessary and damaging content that might otherwise have been made public. This still provides creators with the ability to go and discuss scenarios and do some critical thinking, or even some less critical thinking if they want to, but just uses information that comes from one or two controlled sources. Because of course, if we could build up a network of good creators to sign up to being one of these advocates or first contacts, then suddenly there's a small community of good creators that finally will be rewarded for their good behavior. Well, how and who exactly goes about defining a good or bad creator? Well, that's the big debate. But I do have some ideas, but I'll put those into another video on another Sunday because they will take some time to put together. In conclusion, I think it really is important that we provide some sort of initial advice and some help and guidance to these families when they need the help of social media. But how that package takes its form isn't for me to say. It needs a collection of people to come together to do that. And if anybody is interested, 
please just drop me a line. I'm more than happy to help out. But as I'm in the UK, it's probably appropriate that somebody else takes the lead on this. Anyway, that's my initial take on things. I'm still developing some ideas and these videos are always a little rough because I have a limited amount of time to work on them. But I do want to stress that the ideas that I'm having aren't instead of the letter that Stitch in Leather has put together, but as well as, because I think we need a multi-layered approach to solving some of the issues that we have. But if we don't do anything, then nothing really will change. So I think we're all collectively just trying to do something, we're just not quite sure what it is. And I'm hoping, although this video probably isn't exactly spot on, it might trigger somebody else's ideas and eventually we come up with something that will work. Well, here's the hope. Well, I think that's quite enough of me for one day. So thank you for watching. I hope you found this interesting and thought provoking because that's the idea of it. And for all of those who know me in the true crime community, I'll see you in chat. Sometime, somewhere, maybe.